You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. If this is the first time you're listening to the Vet Me Rehabilitation Podcast, welcome and thank you for taking the time to listen. Please do click the subscribe button so you get notified every Wednesday when you release the next episode. To my longtime listeners, thank you for your continued support. I appreciate each and every one of you. Now, we have some great webinars lined up this week. On our Hydra platform, we have Hydra therapy for patellar luxations and an evidence-based approach to cranial cruciate ligament ruptures on the small animal platform. Now, these get added to our library of vet rehab specific continued education. We have 85 hours now on our Hydra platform, 180 on the small animal platform, and 112 hours on the equine platform. Today's podcast is a revisit from a Facebook Live with Sally J. Foote and Anne. They discuss ways to reduce stress and anxiety in cats. The link between stress, anxiety and pain, the grumpy cat stereotype and the connection to pain. We can do so much more for cats if we can see them in their home environments, helping to create a treatment area in the home where exercises can be performed. They discuss food motivators and the best foods also to use for cats during treatment sessions. You can find out more about what Sally does at drsallyjfoot.com. Before we head over to the podcast, I want to say a thank you to Dominique from at Yorkshire Animal Therapy. Thanks for the shout out about the Veterinary Rehabilitation Podcast on Instagram. Dominique, please, if you're listening, can you email me at meganonpetal.com and I will send you your limited edition Veterinary Rehabilitation mug. If you are listening to the podcast, please take a screenshot, post it in, on Instagram or on Facebook and tag at Online Pet Health. We love hearing from you. Before we head over to the interview, a quick word from our sponsors. Hero Braces is devoted to helping canines lead an active lifestyle by specializing in custom braces for stifle, hock and carpal injuries. The reality is that not all dogs are able to have surgery and custom bracings can be a great alternative that provides stability and allows dogs to remain active. Since each Hero Brace is custom made to every dog, maximum support and comfort with reduced fitting complications is achieved. You can learn more at GoHero.com. So over to Sally and Anae now. Hi guys and welcome. Hi Sally, how are you today? Hi, I'm doing great. It's nice to see you. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us live. It's great to have you. We are going to be talking about cats today and how we can handle them in a better way to reduce stress, reduce fear, and make us more effective in our treatments and rehabilitation. So Sally, as we get started, please introduce yourself. Let us know who you are and your interest in cats. Hey, well, thanks. Hi, my name is Dr. Sally Foote. I am a veterinarian and also an animal behaviorist. I graduated from the University of Illinois here in the United States in 1984. You can probably tell from this. Um, and I, I have always worked in general private veterinary practice here in Illinois in the United States. And in my course, in you know, my course of life as a general practitioner, animal behavior, especially how the like how to help decrease the stress and anxiety for the patient when we they were in care during examinations hospitalization then also how to show the client how to do that at home was a big interest of mine and that blended then also with a uh, growing interest and in i you know took extra coursework and expertise and about like and how how anxiety develops how aggression mm -hmm. develops how the compulsive problems develop so we could nip them in the bud we could give clients advice and even ask preemptive questions. Hey, you know, how's your puppy doing at home to help prevent behavior problems? Then, uh, like I said, through my kind of just course of life, I took extra education at Purdue University's uh, College of Vet Med and an immersive behavior course and became certified as an international, uh, through the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants and developed, uh, you know, a developed medical record system for how to record the uh, handling plan so it could be consistent with the staff and then, you know, grew into authorship, a woman contributing author on the Fear Free program that's here in the United States and also headed Dr. the late Dr. Sophia Yin's company for a number of years after her passing in promoting and, you know, uh, helping to develop some things on the low stress handling certification program. So now I sold my general practice. I do all speaking, writing, online uh, courses myself 
for some for the client and also for veterinary professionals on low stress handling and especially how you're going to, how do you need to do it now with the client in front of you, especially if you cannot reschedule. And that. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So you've always been interested in that behavioral behavioral aspect and making it a little bit more, a little bit easier and stress free for your patients. So Sally, can you dive a little bit more into that relationship between be, between stress and between pain or disease and dysfunction and how those influence one another and why we should why we should care about reducing stress in our patients. Sure. So first of all, we all stress is a pretty, you know, broad word. It can be it can be an emotional stress. It can be, you know, when there is a fear, anxiety, uh, or that anxiety builds so much the animal is actually aggressing to protect themselves, to control their environment. And in that, even if it's in that moment, you know, or in those hours, whether it's at home or it's mm-hmm. at the veterinary practice upon travel to entry and examination, we do have definitely changes in we have changes in physiology as well as physical, right? I mean, mm-hmm. the heart rate is higher because of the increased adrenaline response and the increased cortisol flow to the body. And that is going to have an immediate impact or even later on. I mean, I have known and there have been times people have said like, whoa, the next day after a stressful time, say for an examination, the animal was sore or painful or maybe even had breathing problems or heart problems. So we cannot forget what is changing biochemically, physiologically in the animal when they're stressed at the vet clinic for hospitalization, exam, or care. Number two, you cannot do as good of a thorough examination. Mm-hmm. You know, are you listening to the heart rate on a cat that's, that's at 220? Can you really assess the cardiac function very well in a cat's heart that's beating that fast? No. Now, is that the norm? Or is it because he's, he's sitting there like a little, I call him the meatloaf cat, you know, he's just like this, right? Um, yeah. So we, so when we are doing exams, et cetera, this is why I also feel it's really important to be, have the client there in some way, shape or form, whether it's actually mm-hmm. physically or even they're on a live like this, you know, they can, we can do it now. Video chat, like, is this what your cat looks like laying on the couch at home? Yeah. Because if he is chronically stressed, like this is pretty equal, then yeah, maybe his heart rate does sit there. 150 beats per minute. So that stress is going to induce him into maybe a car, a cardiac event and shorten mm-hmm. his life. So that's that, that is that integration. And then also don't forget too, that same diabetes, mm-hmm. kidney failure, we have dropping protein in the bloodstream. The neurotransmitters are protein bound. They're not going to be able to utilize their serotonin, their dopamine and other, you know, neurochemicals as well for being able to assess and then respond. You know, we do see we do see pain induced aggression as a common situation. So sometimes all people, all clients might see is the dog's growling more if we walk by his food dish. Mm-hmm. They may not have seen the stool and the dog may actually have GI mm-hmm. inflammation that's causing the pain that is related to why now he's growling around his food dish or growling around a toy. Perfect. So while we're on the kind of subject of the behaviors you might see, Please expand a little bit on what we might see in cats if they are stressed or anxious when they come into the clinic to see us. Right. Here's the thing. Cats, you may read and hear like people say, oh, well, cats hide their body language or cats suppress their body language. Mm-hmm. Now, it is true that cats are going to be much more quiet. They're not going to be as overt as, say, compared to a dog. I'm going to compare them to the dog. I'm a small animal mm-hmm. practitioner. You know, pretty much the bread and butter is dog and cat. Okay. And and now we need to remember, why is that? All right. The cat is both the predator and the prey. They kill things that are littler than them. They're killed by things that are bigger than them. Mm-hmm. So as a prey species, they do not want to vocalize. They don't want to yowl. They don't want to cry. They don't want to move around much now because they all kind of just sit still. But if you look at the cat, really learn to look at the cat and observe the cat, you can see the similar body language signs of furrowed brow, you know, uh, tension, the slight hair raising, etc. Now the challenge is their bodies are smaller, so it's harder mm-hmm. to see it. So you just need to start really looking and watching for it. And always think of this, no matter what species you have, what was the response to the stimulus? If there's a, somebody laughs loud, you accidentally drop your pen on the table and the cat does this, right? They really flinch and look around. That cat's vigilant. 
a cat's on the lookout. That cat is, it's, it, the cat is stressed. The reason, they're ready to take flight. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that, that is what we have to now kind of open our eyes to. So, you know, the, there are body language charts available uh, through actually drsophiayin.com is an excellent one that I had created for them. I also have my feline ladder of aggression on my website. Please download that. And it shows how cats go from very simply just sitting still. That's the first level to hiding. And hiding is when they're sitting in the back of the carrier under the seam line, just like quietly like this. That mm-hmm. cat feels really vulnerable. So understanding this is how we can then know. And in pain, the cat's, the body language signs of pain are really just about identical to the body mm-hmm. language signs of stress. And frankly, part of that is because the changes in the neurotransmitters are similar in chronic mm-hmm. pain. We do see a decrease in serotonin. We do see an increase in cortisol. We do see an increase in um, some of the catecholamines like uh, adrenaline. And, and they cause similar, you know, physiological changes. So I like to just emphasize, you know, I never like, I realized I don't need to really think, mm, is it pain or is it anxiety? Just figure it's both because when they're in pain, it's going to increase anxiety. When they're anxious, it, it's going to increase pain if they have any chronic, you know, chronic level of inflammation in their body because of the body tension. Okay. Perfect. So what can we do to handle cats differently to ensure that they have a positive experience with us and that we're reducing those stress levels, but so that we're still being effective? Right. So for cats, especially, uh, there are there are definitely there are guidelines that have been published at the American Animal Hospital Association, the American uh, Association of Feline Practitioners. And while those are nice as guidelines, I guess I'm just going to put it right out here in a nutshell, <laughs> as we say. Uh, number one, get your hands off the cat. The three biggest triggers for I can't see my hand, but oh well. Three biggest triggers for cats to stress is touch, constantly mm-hmm. touching them or keeping a hand on them and increasing the intensity of your touch. Do not scruff cats. Now, you say, I, I gotta have a handle on them. How am I gonna handle them? Okay, there are techniques. One is called the cowl technique where we have a little towel, I use a pillowcase, wrapped around the neck, twist it, and you hold it there. It gives you the same point, holding the cat, but no hands are pinching their body. Mm-hmm. And honestly, kitties are not, they're not scruffed after about the age of three weeks. Mother doesn't pick them up by the back of the neck and scruff them right over. Anyway, stop scruffing cats. You learn the cowl technique. I call it the scruff substitute. I have videos on my YouTube channel. Number two, let's be preemptive. Be preemptive with anxiety reducing supplements or medications. Things like gabapentin is a very good product, even used one time, given two hours, at least two hours before the examination. There have been studies done also for some of these, you know, feral cats coming in for spay neuter, where they gave the cats gabapentin uh, by syringe and a little catheter, you know, just through, because you have to trap them, the mouth and just wait an hour before even handling them for any anesthesia. Anesthesia was smoother, the cats are easier to handle because the gabapentin is decreasing the sensitivity to touch. Remember, as a pain reliever, it is decreasing how fast that, you know, stimulus is going up to the brain. And, and so the gabapentin decreases the sensitivity to touch. See, that helps because you got to touch them. Secondly, it also in, helps working on the GABA receptors. It helps to decrease anxiety. So you get that dual benefit. A lot of cats do well to be given gabapentin. Here in the United States, if I've never f- actually in person examined an animal, I cannot prescribe any pharmaceuticals. So there are supplements. There are supplements like the zilkine, uh, theanine that can be given by the client. Some of the pheromones do those do those things. Tell the clients to set up our cats for success. So let's be preemptive. Let's assume they're going to be stressed coming in here, and that's that is typical. They only come to us at best, maybe once every three or four years, you know, uh, depending on what their health needs are. And some cats have not been in for examination for as long as 10 from the time they were, you know, young and maybe had initial vaccination or neutering to now when they're elderly and they have, you know, problems. Lastly, think about the space, the physical space. I think cats really do better with a lot of home-based care, maybe You know, even Mm -hmm. I have had some cats where we had with really excellent clients (laughs) set up maybe at home to be on IV fluids or we just had them in the day in the clinic in in a quiet ward, say for IV fluids, for treating kidney failure or, you know, health things. And then we capped it off and sent them home to sleep at night. Sleep is so Mm -hmm. restorative to the brain and the body. Then come back the next day for continued IV fluid therapy because they would just be sitting in the back of the cage 
stressed mm -hmm. out, high heart rate, no matter how much you put in the box and all the other things, you can still see this cat. This cat's not using the litter box. He doesn't even want to try to eat. You send them home for a night to sleep. And, and they do, they sleep, they use litter box, even start eating about a day or two earlier. So we really need to reconsider our hospitalization protocols for cats and be creative with home care because our kitty clients, our owners, they will do just about anything for their cats once they know and they understand how to make it less stressful for their cats. They won't do it if we just say, here's the pills, go home and give it to them <laughs> because the cat's biting them and fighting them and they don't know what to do, how to make it better. So let's chat a little bit more about the owners and how we can support them. There are multiple facets to that. And you've mentioned the first one in that they just don't know. How can we help them show them better techniques? How can we anticipate the problems that they might be having with their cats? You know, I think, I think we should just assume with any, any of our pet owners, they do not know how to give a pill. They don't know how, even if they, they don't, it, that is not anything anybody learns they're not in training books how would they know now we our head may not go there because we do this every day and it's oh here watch me give the pill there you go right now that that's not going to translate so i think the first thing is just think of yourself maybe in a way what was it like the very first time i ever needed to give a pill or liquid or you know you so show them that way number two ask what what is it like how has it been for you to try to give a medication to your cat. So then you're going to hear either I've never done it before. Oh, okay. We'll just start you right. Number two, you may hear, oh my gosh, he's horrible. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually I have to wrap him up in a blanket and my partner has to try to give it. We end up scratched and clawed. And I tell you what, the majority of cats have owner directed anxiety and aggression because of trying to give the medication. So not only is the medication not given, we are increasing stress in the home. So in that case, I think ah, well, we have other methods. We can use transdermal gels. Mm -hmm. We can use maybe an injectable. The cat may be much more accepting of an injection, plop of food, eating the food, give the injection, lidocaine, ointment, over the spotting. So be creative. Think mm -hmm. about, can we use a liquid? Even if these need to be compounded, and there might be maybe one or two days delay in medication at least, maybe the first dose or two, the veterinary staff can give, we'd have clients like just pop in here in the morning, we'll do it for you, you know? Mm -hmm because we are more skilled at this and we can get it in them while you're waiting for your compounded meds. So I think uh, let's assume they don't know. So we show them right from the start. Mm -hmm. Secondly, let's ask, let's ask, have you ever done it before? And how is your pet to be medicated? How are you doing it now? So this way we'll know what their skill level is and what they need help with. Mm -hmm. Okay. And thirdly, have very handy for yourself the alternative ways to deliver the same medication, whether it be transdermal, injectable, liquid, or by flavored pills or pills. Okay, perfect. So we have a question from Jill. Jill, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Uh, let me put that up on the screen, actually. So if we are talking about rehabilitation patients, <laughs> would you Sorry, advise that we see our rehab cats at home if possible? Absolutely, yes. This is where telehealth, telemedicine really, really is so valuable. You need to see that animal in their day-to-day -day environment. You got to see how they not only move and ambulate in that day-to-day -day environment, but, but what do they have? You know, what is the space like? I, I do my behavior consultations and I do... I do the telehealth by video chat. I collaborate with primary care veterinarians. So I'm able to, I've done international consultations and I started doing it this way actually about eight years ago. It had nothing to do with the pandemic. And the reason why is because, uh, you know, the aggressive dog is like your primary patient you see. And for cat behavior, I said, yeah, I gotta see this home and people never bring mm -hmm. you enough pictures. So when I did it by Skype the first time, I saw more of the preceding like problems. And I also caught where like these cats were walking, you know, kind of hunched down at the 12 year old cat, not using the litter box, like, whoa. And I could take a quick screenshot, send it to primary vet or say, look at the video from like minute, you know, 45 to 48. Mm -hmm. And I'm not diagnosing, but I would say that cat walks similar to a cat that may have low potassium or maybe mm -hmm. having arthritis in the back. Last vet exam was five years ago. I want you to bring the cat, your cat in for an exam and approve taking x-rays or they might say well i can't get the meds in them 
they gave me the mm-hmm. gabapentin and this, but the cat won't take it. So then I'm, I am advising on how to help give the med or I'll then advise the veterinarian, let's get alternative meds. So absolutely, yes, see the cat in the home. Now, if you come to the home for a house call, you need to know before you even set it up, how does this cat behave when people come into the home? A lot of cats are darting underneath the couch, underneath the middle of the bed, can't get the cat out. So again, you've got to get that ahead information and let's set the cat up for success. Say, okay, I really want to get my hands on the cat and feel them, see if we got weight. I'm going to come to the house. So before I arrive, I want you to give that kitty, say it's dose of gabapentin. Let's put the kitty, that cat, maybe in like a bathroom that there is nowhere he can get underneath something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you've sprayed the room with the feel away, you know, pheromones. And that you, doctor, uh, already have in hand, like your cowl, right? You know, you have your own, you know, you are set up to do low stress handling, which I know many of the pain practitioners are, but that you're set up to keep it the least stressful for the cat and then triage your exam. Because remember all that touch, they don't really like. So maybe order your examination to be what, what are the things I really want to be sure that I get felt and done first because every touch can be kind of stimulating. And then there's ways, and I get more deep into this in some of my online you know, education of how we like touch and give them a little break and touch and give them a break because it's better that their stress is kind of going up and then getting a little relaxation up and a little relaxation than just keep touch, 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 or like blood draw, palpation, et cetera. Okay. So from a physical therapy or physical rehabilitation perspective, the the hands off is very difficult, right? Because we are working with our hands. So I like that suggestion of kind of breaking it up a bit and saying a little bit at a time. And that's really good. And prioritizing what you want to examine and having a very good idea of the plan and the, the problems already in place before you assess the patient before you arrive at the patient's home. So you've mentioned a few things already that we could do to prepare a cat ahead of time uh, in terms of giving gabapentin and pheromones and placing them in a quiet enclosed room. Are there other things that we could advise clients to do ahead of our visit? Potentially they could introduce the cat to some of the touch techniques that we might be using so that they're already familiar with that or some of the ways that we might be holding them or restraining them, anything like that, that we could that we could do or ask our owners to do in preparation so that we have a less stressful initial evaluation. Sure. Yeah. The initial evaluation is always the most, you know, most challenging because the animal's mm-hmm. in the level of pain and we we need to know where the owner is starting from. You know, what can they do, What, whether it's their knowledge or what the cat will accept or even past handling that may have set this cat up for, I don't want you to touch me. It really surprised myself how many clients were scruffing their own cats, you know, mm-hmm. going back to the, I've got to wrap them up in the towel and hold them really tight, right? Okay, so I think the first thing is ask the client, we're in the day and age of all the smartphones, it's very easy. Ask the client, just take a quick little video on your smartphone and send it to me and show me how you are presently because a lot of these cats may be on meds or show me how you would say give meds or pet your cat and hold your cat like the typical handling your cat is receiving and so from that the client that client's going to either show you or say i can't even touch them right some of these cats you can't the client can't even touch okay fine that's our starting point and from that starting point then the doctor is going to know maybe we're, this is going to be staged right we're going to have to sort of stage this examination where we're going to give some pre-meds i may do a small amount of touch for examination maybe i'm even going to have to use sedation to really get an examination all right that's up for the doctor to choose then we're going to show our teach our client how to use things like the cowl technique. We're going to dem- so in those cases on a first exam, it is probably best to bring a veterinary nurse with you who is trained in these low stress skills and tell the client to sit and watch us. Mm-hmm. Now you may have a client who's doing a lot of things really well, right? They've, they're showing things, and okay, again, that's your starting point. So you, you need to know your starting point. That's what I would say. The second thing is let's use hunger as a tool. Hunger mm-hmm. as a motivator. Tell the client to. Do not feed, sorry, do not feed your cat from like 9 p.m. the night before to when I come in. They can have water. Now, mm-hmm. if they, they need medication and the only way the cat will take it is in food, say, okay, one tablespoon of food. I want that cat mm-hmm. hungry because hunger can help over, it, 
you know, overcome or be a motivator to help them decrease. And now you can counter condition to the touch. I have a video or two on my YouTube channel showing exactly how to, I was, it was counter, counter conditioning to touch a highly, you know, uh, hyper aesthetic type cat. It turned long. This cat had been scalped by a weed cutter when he was a kitten and it damaged oh. his eye and his eye was removed. And he, as he was growing up, now suddenly any touch, he was immediately just latching onto people. And so I advised in the, the primary care veterinarian said he was literally bouncing off the walls. I don't know where to start with him. So, okay, I'll see him like, but you prescribe his gabapentin and it's Zilkeen is the supplement. And the cat, as I said, and I told the, you know, in setting up the appointment, I told the owners, do not feed him from night before on. I want him hungry for this exam. So the cat was eating tuna. And so I would just like, just did a little bit of like touch over the head and stopped. So it was all, and I show in my video how to pair it. That he's eating and the minute I touched and he kind of stopped, then I stopped, then we went back to eating, then I touched another part. So it was a very pieced out head exam, but I was able to examine his head, examine his eyes, listen to his heart and lungs. His cat had brain damage. And he did well. He did much better when put on a regular medication and supplementation. Mm -hmm. And it helped manage, it managed the, like it, he was, his sensory system was on overload as a result of his trauma, but then also how, how the owners were interacting with them. So it was a blended behavior. And, but that's how I got the first exam done. So you can go to my YouTube channel. I, I specifically show how you can do a little touch as he's mm -hmm. eating and then you're going to stop. You know, because I could tell as he was starting to escalate, I have to stop. I am the trigger. Mm -hmm. And when he de-escalates, then I can go back and do like a next mm -hmm. step. And I prioritize the parts of the exam. Okay, perfect. I love that. I, I certainly have a cat who is hu hungry. If he doesn't get his food on time, he is so hungry and vocal about it. So I can see that food would be a really good motivator for them. In terms of the kind of food that you're using, you mentioned tuna is a good one. Uh, what are some other ideas that we could use as food motivators? So when it comes to food, I like to call it food's your paycheck. <laughs> if you're asking them to do a more difficult job, just like your employee, you better be paying them more money, right? So the really highly flavored, I also want food that is like soft. So you just, cause you have to pair just like one little dollop at a time, literally for every part of the touch, every part of what you're doing. So not a big bowl that they have in front of them. So mm -hmm. things like, you know, pureed meat, like baby food. A uh, tuna is good. You might need to puree it, but that's how you can take like just little flakes, just one little flake mm -hmm. for every little part of the touch that so you're continually giving that to him. And, and then that's how you also can judge, is he still going after this piece? Because with a whole bowl full in front of them, it requires the cat mm -hmm. to have to like assess it. And anyway, mm -hmm. so you want something like baby food, you know, pureed meat, tuna is good. Some people like the bento flakes, stinky. It needs to be smelly. All right, you're going to warn your client because that's cats need to smell it. It yeah. needs to have an easy mouth texture. We also need it to be easy to digest mm -hmm. because when those stress hormones are high, it inflames the gut and the cat. That's why many of our cats are having vomiting and diarrhea in a chronic state. But also, too, when they're coming in, if they're stressed, their gut and anticipate and expect that their gut might be slightly inflamed. So a, a pureed, simple meat, you know, a, the Ger Gerber is a brand here in the United States, sorry. But the baby food that you can, you can, we would just draw that up in like a syringe and just slowly squirt it down on the plate for the cat to eat. So it's like eight and it's like, okay, is there more? Yeah, that's exactly what I want you to think, right? But that's e very easily digested by all cats. So okay. that, and, and, and low in fat. So it like kind of was, this is a good one for everybody, you know, to have tuna was another one we commonly used. If they like some cats, like the crunchy treats, you know, but by and large, especially in a painful, cause these painful cats tend to be geriatric or they're young with trauma mm -hmm. that I'm going, I, I tended to go more for the, you know, or like some of these recovery pureed diets. Uh, I don't know all of the names they go under outside of the United States, but in the United States, they would go under like AD, Anorectic Diet by Hills, or Recovery Diet by the Royal Canin Company. Okay, perfect. My follow-up question to that would be, uh, do you find that 
these treat you're supplying the treats generally right you're bringing them with you do you find that most cats are accept accepting them because cats tend to be quite specific about what they eat right they're generally sticking to one kind of diet or food or food source so switching that up is usually difficult do you find they accept whatever you're bringing with you quite easily yeah so we always how should I say it? kept track because you know cats will vote with their tongue right so <laughs> we just kept track of what what tended to work for most cats okay. so what we found we me myself and my my staff you know and we'd be doing this work so what we found was ham baby food and either turkey or chicken baby food Gerber brand don't ask me why I am not paid by Gerber but Gerber brand <laughs> And uh, no, they didn't like beech nut. They didn't like any of the other ones. I got to find Gerber. Um, and then just two in a pack of water. And we, okay. we had like a little, you know, it was like mini food choppers to really puree it up, you know, yeah. coming out of the can. Oh, so yeah. it was just, you know, when examining a range of cats, we we found this, this is one that works for just about everybody. So those were the mm -hmm. ones we always had. And then we would ask the client, does he have anything he really, really likes? And if the client knows it, then the client can supply it, you know? Mm -hmm. So that way, again, go back to that, you know, f before you even come for the exam, getting these kind of, get this kind of history, show me this, show me where I can examine this cat in your home. Let's, mm -hmm. what room might we use? We might use the dining room table. We might use the bathroom. You know, mm -hmm. you can put the lid down on the toilet and sit on the toilet or use the counter by the sink to do the examination. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that at all. You know? Okay. I love it. I think that's, in terms of rehabilitation, we're generally going to be seeing these cats over a period of time and we're going to be working with the owner in terms of creating a home program um, and supporting them through exercises and things like that. What could you suggest to make it easier for us to prescribe home exercises and to prescribe movement to cats? How can we help encourage that? All right. <laughs> Every species in the world says, well, what's in it for me? Why should I do this? Right? All right. The first thing, hunger. <laughs> this is stop feeding the cats out of a bowl. And that has been recommended for years to the AFP. We need to like hide small dishes around the house, but I'm going to get more specific than that. All right. It's physical therapy time, right? And maybe once or twice a day, we need to do, say, passive range of motion exercises, or you want you know, you want the cat to like walk a straight line just to start with across the room. And then maybe you're going to lay little, I don't know what, you know, rolls of fabric to get them to step over, you know, like the Cavaliers. Okay. Cats will follow you around if they think you have food. So you have your dish of maybe it's tuna, maybe it's the baby food, maybe it's the little chewy treats, whatever this cat really likes. And, and cats will come when called. You shake it and they come and say, okay, you're one or one or two nuggets right here in front of your little workout station. And then you are gonna, and the owner, you tell the owner, you're gonna walk like five paces and drop the nugget. So the cat's gonna follow you. And then he gets the nugget, that's his reward for following you. And then you keep walking five paces. And that's how we're gonna get the cat to start doing, you know, that straight line gate walking. This is how he earns dinner. Now, clients might think, oh my God, I'm gonna stay, starve my cat. No, you will not. And the cat will do this if the clients stop feeding out of the bowl, and, and we just have, we have to help the client understand why would he get up and follow you across the room if there was nothing in it for him? He can't understand that walking across this room is going to make it easier for him to get in and out of the litter box and go to the bathroom. Now, someone can explain that to you, right? And that would be pretty motivating, but we can't tell him. So we just need to give him reason to do this movement, which will then reflect in that benefit for him. Okay. So tossing, like dropping the food or having the little, and I had clients like, wow, my 15 year old cat is following me around the house. She's moving so much better. The second thing is you can make games with the food, put the food in food puzzles. But now for passive range of motion, sorry, I'm talking more, need to talk more specifically now. I call it targeting. It's not really clicker training targeting, but this would be say, okay, again, if say we're going to do, um, maybe we're going to do massage, you know, down the spine of the cat, do the palpation like this down across the lumbar muscles to warm them up. All right. This again is watch my video. It's uh, with the uh, counter. It's called counter conditioning cat to a touch. That's basically this. You're going to put a plop of the food. He's eating the food as your hands are going down the massage. 
And when you're done, like when the, if the cat stops eating, you stop because the cat's saying, ouch, that hurts. All right. And that's also helpful for the client to know, am I doing it? Because they're wanting, am I doing too hard or not? And for you to know. Okay. So as he's eating, that's as you're doing the palpation, then you give him another small amount. And then maybe it might be, okay, if you have to do turning the head like this or up and down like this, you know, say, okay, I'm going to turn the head twice, give a plop of food. So again, teach the client, you're going to do small, like a couple of motions, give them a little, just a, when I say a plop of food, I am talking like if you had a little syringe, half a mil of that baby food, just a lick. So you kind of like, here's a lick of a lollipop. Okay, now let's do a couple flexions, another lick of a lollipop, another couple flexions. So that's how you do it. And that's how the cat gets conditioned to accept it. Then over time, the cat can be like, okay, I could take 10 flexions and then get a bigger plop because you can positively condition him to the touch as well as got him to learn to get in position. And I'm a big, I really recommend it for clients, always make a treatment area. And this treatment area is whether it's on the floor or on a table with a nice blanket on it. And you bring the cat up there when you're not treating the cat. You're not doing any physical therapy and you give him some treats and leave him alone. So that he learns, this is really, oh, that's like my awesome spot. I like being up here, you know? So then when it's treatment time, he's not like, oh, great. It's not always about treatment. Just like we say for coming to the veterinary office, we want you to come for happy visits. Just come, say hi to the receptionist and leave. Not a big deal. Come, just get on the scale, leave, see ya, right? It's not a big deal. It's not always about, you know, touch and blood draws and everything. All right. I love our questions here because I can very much relate. So we have a question. I find it hard to see the difference between a cat exhibiting behavior because he's annoyed versus behavior because of pain. What if the cat is just super moody and hates everything? How can you tell if it's really sore besides going to the vet? Absolutely. Like I said, pain and anxiety run together. You don't know which it is and he can't tell you. So I, I always go for my pain relief pain relief medications that are also going to reduce anxiety. Don't worry about it. You need to get this cat in a mental state where he's going to accept touch. All right. Get him in that mental state where he can accept touch and examination. And then you can do that to determine which it is. But please don't say, well, you know, which is it? So this is where medications like gabapentin address both. Gabapentin mm -hmm. works on the GABA receptors to reduce anxiety. It facilitates serotonin to enter the frontal cortex. Gabapentin also decreases, you know, that afferent transmission of, you know, stimuli and touch for the perception of pain. So it's going to help mm -hmm. to decrease pain. Even an NSAID, uh, an NSAID one-time dose, while it's not direct, okay, so that is going more directly about pain. I think you can ca categorize things, right? If we know 90% of our cats over the age of nine have some form of arthritis along the spine mm -hmm. or the elbow, very likely pain's involved. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so do the do pain, but add something also for anxiety. Use the pheromones, add a supplement. It will, ne it will never hurt. It mm -hmm. will never hurt. And remember, because of the pain, anxiety is always elevated. So so just address both and you're gonna, it's going to help you and the animal out. Awesome. Uh, can catnip help calm them down? Oh, catnip is a little bit of a wild card. <laughs> I don't use catnip for that reason. Catnip has, you know, an herb. For some cats, they're going to get really buzzed, you know, like, ah. Uh, some cats, it's very, like, elevating. And okay. it does enhance like the taste of things and the smell of things. So some cats get really more active and more up. And I don't, we don't want our cats really moving around the room a lot or moving around a lot because all that movement is increasing, you know, adrenaline and such in the body and will increase sensitivity to touch. So I do not advise for catnip during exams, not especially in a cat that may be older or painful. And, and one client said, okay, my cat catnip and you started beating up on the other cats. I said, well, he's <laughs> drunk. You know, catnip can disinhibit aggression. So I rarely use catnip at all during my exams for that reason. I was in general practice. I I was into, I needed to integrate both medicine, you know, and behavior. And I use catnip more if we need to enhance maybe appetite, you know, or get this cat who's been hiding chronically mm -hmm. to perhaps kind of come out and want to play, but not during exams. Okay. I like that. I want to come back to the, to the behavior pain relationship because in 
For example, in horses, we know that, and I know we're not talking about horses, but we now know that certain behaviors are linked to pain. If they're displaying specific behaviors, it's not because they're moody or naughty or pain in the butts. It's because they're painful. So we don't have that, that data and information yet in cats, but it makes sense for it to be the same. It makes sense to say cats are not normally moody um, they're not normally aggressive. That's not normal cat behavior. Please correct me if I'm wrong. It is most likely pain. What do you think? Well, there has been more and more evidence built up. It, please go to the American Association of Feline Practitioners website, and that there been there have been a lot of studies, especially through North Carolina State University, on that cats the, the body language and the behaviors that cats do are related to pain, especially mm-hmm. when the when we're having inner cat aggression in the home because what's happening usually is the more mature cat or cat that may have had injury and we may not know it was a rescue cat cannot get up on the perches so readily so we're having more aggression like on the floor when the cats are passing by each other but the reason for this competition over space is actually related to the chronic pain in the cat's body i know that dr amy pike she's a diplomat american college of veterinary behaviorists has been doing a lot of writing about the relationship between pain and behavior she has been writing about it in dogs i do know uh there had she has done some about cats dr margaret gruen who's also from the american college of veterinary behaviorists has been working together with Dr. LaSalle's on some various studies of pain relief and seeing behavior improvement in cats. So we do have documentation, we do have evidence uh, for the relationship between pain and cats. And uh, Dr. Sheila Robertson, who is also uh, boarded in anesthesiology and pain management, she has been speaking a lot, you know, about this relationship of pain management, behavior, anesthesia, etc. So, so if if you have, I know you, I'm lo- this is an international audience, and sometimes at my office, <laughs> my journal stack would be like this, <laughs> and I'd be a little behind. Well, whatever. You know, it's hard. It's life, right? Yeah. Which is great about these kind of interviews, yeah. uh, that there is there is definitely building evidence in, um, for this. And so if, if you have a chance, even just go to the a- AAFP website. There's a lot in there it would pulled from all these sources. And I would just say this. All right. Response to therapy, right? Response to mm-hmm. therapy is a method of diagnosis. Mm-hmm. If we cannot get our hands on them to draw blood, we cannot get our hands on them to take, uh, you know, radiographs, x-rays, etc. And And neurological, you know, neurological pain may not show up on an x-ray. So if we give them a medication that is more focused on inflammation reduction, you know, or that uh, pain, and they improve, <laughs> that's telling you right there that there is that, that pain is part of what also affected and it was changing their behavior. So. Good. No, I'm really glad. I, I'm really glad because I think it's it's such an important thing for us to realize that maybe that cat that I that I had as a child who was so moody, aggressive, batted yeah. at me all the time. It wasn't just because that's what it was like. It was there was a reason behind it. I'm really glad. Let's break those stereotypes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just a quick note. Yesterday, I was talking to a referring veterinarian on a feline human directed aggression case. I mean, this cat was attacking attacking mm-hmm. one of the pat partners in bed at night. Surprised this man still had this cat, quite frankly. <laughs> and so on my telehealth consultation as we're going through the home with the cat and where the cat was like, okay, you know what I mean? Could be around this man. And where where some of the incidents happened, I watched how the cat moved. And the cat was not jumping was not jumping up on its old perches and watching the cat walk its tail was not up in its typical posture Mm -hmm. and how its back legs were I said I really suspect this cat has some lower back pain she was seven years old so the primary referring vet I recommended you know getting the cat on pain relief as well as some changes in the home and and within three weeks that cat was was rubbing on and purring to the man that the cat was attacking and i taught i spoke with the referring vet now it's been almost a year from the consult and i said well i guess the cat's still doing okay she goes oh yeah she said I, it was pain as soon as we got that cat on the gabapentin and the joint supplement that cat was much better they now have a dog <laughs> she goes they got a puppy and the cat's getting along with the puppy i'm like oh my gosh great plan <laughs> okay that's great <clears throat> All right, another 
Another question here. Uh, would you recommend or think it's a good idea to maybe give the cat an enrichment? Example, snuffle mats or lick mats, and then conduct your initial assessment. If the cat is comfortable and has done this type of enrichment, of course, would that enhance the consult oh, yes. and bring more positivity to the situation? You know, I like to just say this. Whatever makes them happy, put it in with the exam. So an, I, an enrichment mat, if they like that, a snuffle mat. I had one client. She had, a, she had a barn. She had horses. And she had her, you know, we call them inside cats, outside cats. So the cats who lived in the barn, they were very friendly. She took great care of all her pets. Mm -hmm. she, she had to bring one of her barn cats because he got in a fight with something and he had an abscess on the side of his head. And, uh, you know, to start the exam, she goes, oh, hold on, hold on. Can I put my barn coat down? Because he loves my a barn coat's like a heavy canvas coat yeah. usually with the flannel, you know, cot, like fuzzy cotton lining. And I said, sure. Yeah, if he loves your coat, let him lay on the coat. I don't care. You know, I mean, whatever makes him happy, right? So her cat, her cat laid on the, laid on the coat. And he was kind of like all hunkered up because he's in pain. He's got an abscess. He's got mm -hmm. a fever. And he sticks his head, you know, right in the sleeve where it comes in to join the body. And he starts purring. Oh. And so I'm like. He can breathe fine. Just let him keep his head in there. So I could do the whole exam. I give him pain relief. I put some topical or sorry, some, you know, injectable um, topical anesthetic because I just needed to do a quick glance. It was, I mean, it was ready to go and flushed it. And he was fine because he was in her barn coat. So I, I <laughs> anything's fine. All right. Just say to your clients, whatever he loves, we put that in the exam. That's what he's going to lay on. Whatever. If they don't mind, it, it really it, it, it does absolutely zero to hamper our ability and it will enhance. So yes, snuffle mat. Yes, anything. So have the client wear the aftershave or perfume the cat likes. I'm not kidding about that. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, cats like specific smells. Right? Yes, they do. Oh, especially men's cologne. <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, there was a study with cheetahs and zoos to help get them with their enrichment. These cheetahs loved Calvin Klein's Obsession perfume. Ew. They sprayed it, uh, and I guess maybe they found the zookeepers who wore it. These cheetahs were a lot better and happier around them than <laughs> not. And so somebody decided to do a study. And anecdotally, these cats are like, oh, this cat loves my husband. And I said, well, does your husband wear an aftershave? Yeah, yeah he does. He always wears like Chaps by Ralph Lauren. These kind of, you know what I mean, specifically scented. Hey, you're going to spray that all over the house. Because if that's the scent, scents are, cats are very scent specific that they like and that they don't mm -hmm. like. They do not like citrus smells. So if anybody's oh, using yeah. citrusy orange cleaners, lemon cleaners, do not wear, you know what I mean, anything citrusy yourself when examining a cat. If you, I don't know, have like lemon hand sanitizer, do not, no, none of that. Lavender, mm -hmm. lavender can be very calming for the cat. So you could put lavender essential oil on yourself. You could have a lavender essential oil diffuser in the room. And that also can be very calming for the cats. The cats like that too. Oh, I really like that. I did not know that about citrus. I love citrus. So yeah. I always have citrus running somewhere. <laughs> no wonder my cat prefers my husband. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm all out of questions. Um, Sally, can you think of anything else that our audience should know about reducing stress in cats in their patients, specifically rehab patients that have chronic pain? Uh, yes, I really strongly advise you to, to add a tele, tele, a video chat, video call consultation to see the home. You need to see the home. See the home, like, oh, here's where my cat sleeps, here's where he lays, here's his litter box. See that litter box. Exactly how high they have to step over, you know, uh, where else they need to go. People think, oh, I've got plenty of perches, and they have two. And they really need, or maybe the perches need to be modified to make it easier for the cat to get up there. So now that they have a two-year-old child that you might not have known, you know, crawling mm -hmm. around the house, the cat can get her easily away from the children. I have a lot of, uh, please join my YouTube channel. I have a lot of videos on there showing exactly how to do these things. I have a website. Uh, I do offer behavior consultations and I can work together with any veterinarian to help you even with setting up, say, a rehab, you know, how we can we do this in the home? How can we, you know, get that cat positively conditioned to do this plan that you've mm -hmm. outlined, you know, for therapy? Because we all want to and we work together. I always report back to the primary vet. So DrSallyJFoot.com is my website and you can see my, you know, my on demand, um, whatever, my education there through the shop, my blog. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. It's under Dr. Sally J. Foote. 
and then I have my own my Facebook page called Foot and Friends, and I'm also on LinkedIn. So, yeah. awesome! Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Thank you, and what an awesome discussion. So, thanks so much for joining us live. It's been really great having you. Bye. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. A big thank you to our sponsor, Go Hero Braces. Their sponsorship allows us to be able to give this podcast to you for free. So please go and check them out, goherogo.com. Don't forget also to bookmark the Vet Rehab Summit. It is on the Saturday, the 12th of November. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference. It's created specifically for you, the Vet Rehabber community. Online Pet Health members get VIP complimentary access to the Vet Rehab Summit. For more information about continuing education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepethealth.com.